And before I launch into case study number one, I want to give you four general tips, four general tips about the way in which you should approach disciplinary and dismissal scenarios. Now, of those of you who are line managers, not HR, can you just put your hand up if you've never done a disciplinary or performance process? Just one, two, three, and who has four? Who has the slight majority? Um, four general tips on how to actually handle this sort of situation. Tip number one is always keep a written record of all important conversations. If you're having an important conversation with somebody about their performance, if you're having a conversation with someone about their, uh, the way that they've done something or not done something, keep a note of it, even if it's just an email to yourself. Because judges tend to believe what's written down. I know Donald Trump's written a book. Jeffrey Archer's written many, but judges tend to believe what's written down. And uh, witnesses lose cases, documents win cases. It's a very well-known truism when it comes to legal practice. If it's written down, at the time, a judge is much more likely to think it's happened. And it's important to keep not only notes, but accurate notes. It's important to keep accurate notes because sometimes, if you're the manager uh, or the HR professional, you might find that the employee's been carrying, oh, it's got my emails on there, has been carrying one of these in their pocket the whole time and making a covert recording of any meeting you've had with them. Be aware that sometimes employees covertly record meetings. And it can really cause employers to come a cropper if their account of a conversation is different from that which the recording shows. I did a case, some of you will have heard me tell this story. I did a case uh, probably about six or seven years ago now involving a very well-known high street chain. I'm not going to tell you who they are. A very well-known high street chain where some items of stock had gone missing from their shops. And they knew that either the manager of this particular store or the assistant manager was to blame for it. They didn't know which one. They called them in. They were going to investigate. And if they couldn't work out which, they were going to dismiss both. So far, normal. When the claim forms came in from the two managers who'd been dismissed, they alleged in their claim form that the CEO of this organisation, who was a big, physically imposing guy, very garrulous, very outgoing, very extrovert, very intimidating, they alleged that the CEO had walked into the room where the disciplinary hearing was going on, started banging on the table, shoving his face in their faces and saying, you effing bastards, where am I, stock? I'm going to get you lot deported back to where you came from. And, of course, the company denied it. They denied it in their response to the tribunal claim. When they put together the witness statements, which I helped with, they denied it. The CEO said he was never there. Uh, he wasn't a witness because he was too important to be a witness. But the head of HR and the head of legal, both of whom were in the room, denied the CEO was there. Went into the witness box, denied they were there on oath. Rather, the head of HR and head of legal denied the CEO was there on oath. Then it came to my turn to cross-examine the employees, and I started to put to them that they were making up this entire story about being bullied by the CEO. And, of course, one of the employees put his hand in his pocket and said, would you like to hear the recording? Which went down like a bucket of wet sick. <laughs> and, as you can imagine, we settled that fa claim fairly quickly after that. They got quite a lot of money for signing a deal not to ever tell the papers about it. But um, bear in mind, at any time in any of these meetings, you could be secretly being recorded by somebody's phone. So number one, keep a note. Number two, keep it accurate because of that. Number three, um, raise and deal with issues promptly. Raise and deal with issues promptly. Don't unreasonably delay meetings. It's very easy to put meetings off and off and off. I'll talk about this in more detail when I talk about appeals. But keep the time between meetings short. Does anyone here work for a local authority? Or the NHS? Or colleges? Or some other public body? Yep. Are you really rubbish at keeping the timescale tight? You're not? Well done. Many, many, many local authorities really struggle with this. And it can take, I see cases where it can take a year or even more from first disciplinary allegation to appeal being resolved. In reality, it's rarely, rarely acceptable for it to take more than three months. And number four, if you're a line manager and you want more detailed advice, ask HR. That's what they're there for. HR will be delighted to help because they'd rather you got it right than got it wrong. There's more work for them when you get it wrong. But they'd equally rather you're not phoning them up every two or three minutes. Um, so, so use them as troubleshooters, but don't use them as handholders. is a pretty good guide. Is that fair, Alan? It's fair. Excellent. 
So um, there are four very basic rules. I'm going to come on now to the very first case study of the two I want to talk about. And it involves a travel agency. Now, these two case studies are both true stories. They are both cases I personally dealt with. I'm not going to tell you the names. I'm going to change the names of the people involved, but they are both actual cases, and they're very typical cases. I haven't selected them because they're weird or wonderful or particularly funny. I've selected them because they are typical cases that every one of you and I will deal with on a regular basis. So case number one involves a travel agency. You'll all know which one it is, but I'm not going to say the name, but it's a, um, it's a very high-level boutique travel agency that puts together holidays for wealthy individuals. Now, this travel agency had a number of telephone salesmen. One of them was called Ian. Ian was a brilliant telephone salesman. He earned a fortune in commission. He was very, very good at his job. And Ian was a typical salesman. He was a bit flash, drove a fast car, liked the fast life, came from Essex. And he um, had one big bugbear. His big bugbear was a chap called Marcus. Marcus was the IT person in the company. Marcus was the IT person. And Ian had a problem with his computer. His computer was a bit slow. And Ian thought that if the, his computer was faster, he'd make more sales and earn more money. But the problem was, Marcus was just a really lousy IT person, and every time Ian phoned up to say, can you sort this out, Marcus would not turn up, would turn up and do something wrong, would just generally not do a very good job. So Ian thought Marcus was costing him money, and there was constant simmering hostility, bordering on absolute hatred between them, because Marcus equally bitterly resented Ian. He resented Ian's lifestyle, he resented Ian's success with the women, he invented Ian's overall um, job. Fast forward to Valentine's Day, or Valentine's Evening 2016. Ian, the salesman, is the last of the great romantics. He's gone down to the Red Lion pub with his very understanding girlfriend. The Red Lion's getting into the Valentine's mood, so they're playing Rick Astley, they're having a meat raffle, they're doing everything that's every starry-eyed young Essex boy's dream. And uh, Ian and his girlfriend are getting increasingly drunk here when who should walk in but Marcus? Not with a girlfriend, because he works in IT, but Marcus <laughs> walks in with a couple of male friends of his and starts drinking. They keep exchanging glances over the bar, and Ian decides he's going to have it out with Marcus. So Ian walks up to Marcus. They're both a bit drunk. And Ian says to Marcus, why aren't you fixing my computer? There might have been a few extra words thrown in there, but the gist of it was, why aren't you fixing my computer? And Marcus turns to Ian and replies, it's because I've been so busy fixing your mum. <laughs> now, of course, that doesn't actually mean anything, but we all know what Ian thought it meant. Ian thought it meant, I've been shagging your mum. So he does what any red-blooded male would do. He threw a punch at Marcus. Marcus goes down on the floor. Ian's asked to leave the pub. End of the night's events. But there are a lot of people from this travel firm in the pub that night, and word gets back very quickly to the employer. Ian's manager hears about it the next day. He hears Ian has punched out Marcus. Now, if you were Ian's manager, what would you do at this stage? Any thoughts? Fact find. Fact find in what way? Yeah. Um, will you be my manager for this session? Brilliant. Can you just come and write your name on the flip chart? Imran, thank you. Uh, Imran, face the board. Let me put that on you. Turn around. And <laughs> Imran is going to be the manager who does all of the firing today. You can take it off. Thank you. Go and grab a seat. But I, do you mind if I ask you a few questions while you're sitting there? Yeah. Yep, great. Um, Imran, the manager, hears about Ian punching out Marcus. And uh, Imran takes the view, well, you know what? I like Ian. He makes me quite a lot of money because I get commission off his commission. So I don't want to do anything about this, even though Ian probably shouldn't have punched out Marcus, so I'm just going to ignore it. Which is actually fair enough. It's a perfectly reasonable approach to take, because the event happened outside work, 
in a pub, etc., etc. It wasn't really closely connected with work. So far, so good. Nothing wrong so far. But then Marcus turns up to work and he goes off to HR. And Marcus says to HR, I'm just not prepared to work with Ian anymore. And if you don't sack Ian, I'm going to resign and claim constructive dismissal because you're not taking my grievance seriously. So HR say to Imran, come on Imran, you're going to have to put Ian through a disciplinary. At this point, I'm going to run very quickly through the basics of a fair dismissal. In most cases, an employee can't claim unfair dismissal unless they've worked for at least two years. So anyone who's worked for less than two years can't claim unfair dismissal. In essence, the first two years of anyone's employment is a probationary period, no matter what the contract says about the length of the probationary period. There are a couple of exceptions to that. So you can't dismiss people within the first two years for pregnancy. You can't dismiss them for whistleblowing. You can't dismiss them for trade union activities. Any of those three will do. It doesn't need to be all three, although if you've just blown the whistle to the papers that you're expecting Ian McCluskey's love child, you've probably got a job for life. <laughs> but generally, managers have two years during which they can dismiss uh, for any reason, unless that reason's also discriminatory. Once someone's got two years under their belt, then they get the right not to be unfairly dismissed. And that right has three aspects to it. Number one, they can only be dismissed for what lawyers call a fair reason. Those are the five fair reasons. I'll come back to them. Number two is the employer's got to follow a fair procedure. Number three, dismissal has to be a fair response. I'll come back to each of these in just a tad more detail. But we're not going to spend too long on the law. Fair reasons for dismissal. The bottom two there are hardly ever used. Breach of legal obligation is where um, it's illegal to employ somebody. So, for example, a driver who loses their driving licence, it would be illegal to continue employing them. It would be a breach of a legal obligation to continue employing them. Some other substantial reason is just a catch-all one that's hardly ever used. The big three are capability, conduct, conduct and redundancy. Capability is where someone can't do their job. We'll talk about that in case study two. Either can't do it because they're rubbish or can't do it because they're not there, because they're ill for a long period of time. Conduct is... Conduct, misconduct, we all know what that is. Redundancy is where uh, the, the needs of the business for a workforce is shrinking. So a business that had five telephonists and now only needs three telephonists will make two of those telephonists redundant. Um, it's actually quite easy to remember them if you think of them as the three browns, the three browns. So you've got capability brown, you've got divine brown. You need to think about that one for a second and you've got Gordon Brown. <laughs> Three Browns. Um, so, question one, is there a fair reason for dismissal? Question two, did the employer follow a reasonable procedure? That's basically following the ACAS code, and it's going to be what I'm going to be talking to you about for the next couple of hours. It's very, very, very heavily box ticking. That's what dismissals are all about. It's going through the procedure, it's box ticking. If you tick the boxes, it's very easy to justify the dismissal to a tribunal, should you ever end up in one. And number three, reason, um, fair reason, reasonable procedure, and dismissal has to be a reasonable sanction. So a tribunal would say it's unfair to dismiss somebody for using a, pers a postage stamp for personal use, because that's a disproportionate reaction. You can't sack someone it's unreasonable to sack someone who's got more than two years' employment with you, because if they've got less than two years, it doesn't matter. It's unreasonable to sack someone who's got more than two years' employment with you just for misusing a postage stamp. If they use a thousand postage stamps, that's different, but the sanction of dismissal has to be proportionate. So back to the Valentine's Day punch-up. You'll remember HR has told Imran to start a disciplinary into Ian, Ian the salesman who threw the first punch. First thing Imran has to decide is should he suspend Ian before going through a disciplinary. Quick show of hands, who thinks Ian should be suspended? Imran does, decisions made. Nobody else? It's really awful when you sit right at the front of the room because you can't see no one behind you is actually responding to anything. Who thinks Ian shouldn't be suspended? Yep, about six people. And the others, uncertain, depends. What Imran does, not Imran of course, but the real manager in this case, what Imran does is indeed suspend Ian, which is absolutely fine. There are two occasions when you can suspend somebody. 
Number one is where it's plainly gross misconduct. Number two is where there's a good reason to keep the employee out of the workplace. Now, what he ended to Marcus isn't plainly gross misconduct. It took, away, it took place away from the office. If it happened in the office, it's obviously gross misconduct. Away from the office, maybe, maybe not. But number two gets ticked here. Because Marcus has said he can't carry on working with Ian, there's a real risk that if the two of them meet in a corridor, there could be further arguments. It's reasonable to take the decision to keep Ian out of the office until the disciplinary proceedings are concluded. Now, an important point, suspension carries a stigma. It's not a neutral act. Despite every single letter that every HR person in the room has ever written saying suspension is a new, who's written that? Suspension is a neutral act. Of course you will have. Come on, admit it. You will have, yes? Yeah, little nods. Um, every single HR letter ever when suspending someone says suspension is a neutral act. It's not. It carries a stigma. It carries, at minimum, the implication to the rest of the workforce that the employer thinks you might have or probably done something wrong. I could write a letter saying I'm six foot tall and blonde, but just because I write it in a letter doesn't make it true. And the same with saying suspension is a neutral act. Tribunals regard suspension as a um, provocative act. And it's fine to do it if you've got good cause, number one or two, but not if you haven't. And there have been a number of cases where an employer's gone badly wrong by suspending prematurely when they didn't have reasonable grounds to do so. And that's ended up being a constructive dismissal later on down the line. So Imran suspends Ian. I think rightly so. Imran wrote a letter to Ian Imran, the manager, to Ian, the salesman, saying, it's alleged you were involved in a fight with Marcus on Valentine's Day in the Red Line pub. Serious allegation. If established, you may be dismissed for gross misconduct. Um, what should be in a disciplinary letter? I'm going to give you four points on this. Number one, it's got to contain enough information about the details of the allegation of misconduct and its consequences to enable the employee to prepare a full response. So you need to be very clear about what punch-up you're talking about. Although, of course, if Ian responds and says, sorry, which punch-up is this? I get muddled up between them all. He's going to struggle in his defence anyway. So number one, letter's got to be clear. Number two, be very specific with allegations. Excuse me. Um, don't make vague references to a breach of policy. If the employee is suspected of dishonesty, say they're suspected of dishonesty. I um, do, the, the only employee client I act for is for a small union that just represents um, employees at one particular high street bank. I'm not going to tell you which one. 95% of my work is for the employer, 5% is for this union, and I represent all their members who get dismissed from this bank. And this bank has this bizarre policy, it's called the personal integrity policy. That policy says in it, in order to maintain your personal integrity, you mustn't breach any of the bank's rules. And every time they discipline somebody, every time they discipline someone, they always add the allegation, you've breached the personal integrity policy. In other words, you've breached the rule that says you mustn't breach a rule. And it's very easy for any competent barrister, even me, to make the managers who include that in the letter look absolutely ridiculous when they're being cross-examined. Golden rule when you're framing the allegations is keep them short. Don't add make weights. If you can't frame allegations in just one or two or three allegations that justify dismissal, adding a fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh one isn't going to get you over the hurdle. But keep the allegations clear. Number three. Provide copies of any witness evidence. Might be notes of the meeting you had with Marcus where Marcus said, Ian punched me. And number four, stating the obvious, make sure the letter has the time, the date, the venue for the meeting, and remind the employee of their right to be accompanied. I'll come back to the right to be accompanied in just a moment. So going back to the letter that Imran sent to Ian, the salesman, it said, it's alleged you were involved in a fight with Marcus on the 14th of Feb in the Red Line pub, blah, blah, blah. Now, a pedant could have a go at this letter, because that sounds like a pretty clear allegation. A pedant, for which read barrister, could have a go at this letter by saying the precise allegation isn't that 
Ian was involved in a fight. Marcus was involved in a fight as well. The precise allegation is Ian started the fight. Ian threw the first punch. But it would be very pedantic to take that point. That would not be enough to make a dismissal unfair. Don't use euphemisms when you're putting together the, the letter. Uh, use clear language. Don't get all 1950s about it. So if there's an allegation that somebody has harassed a colleague, don't start saying things like, uh, you're accused of doing all manners of frightfulness or something perfectly unspeakable. Be really, really clear in the allegations. And what happens next? Ian gets this letter and he writes to HR and says, whoa, what's going on? Yeah, I threw a punch at Marcus, but he provoked me. He said, I shagged your mum. It should be him that's up for a disciplinary, not me. Now, of course, Marcus didn't say, I shagged your mum. He said, I fixed your mum. Not sure there's much of a difference, but Ian heard it as I shagged your mum. He was a bit drunk. That's what he remembers. The difference will become important a little bit later. So M Ian puts in a grievance to HR saying, why aren't you bringing Marcus into a disciplinary? And HR do exactly the right thing, exactly the right thing. They tell Imran, Ian's manager, to include Marcus in the disciplinary process and do a disciplinary against each of them. Against Ian for throwing the first punch and against Marcus for provoking him. It's sensible to do it with just the one manager taking both decisions, because if you have two managers, one taking a decision for Ian, one taking a decision for Marcus, they could come up with spectacularly opposite conclusions, which just makes things really, really messy. So Imran goes back to his computer. He pulls up the letter he sent to Ian, setting out the charges, and he changes it for Marcus. So to Marcus, he says, it's alleged you were involved in a fight with Ian. He's changed the name there on the 14th of Feb in the Red Lion pub, etc., etc., etc. Is that letter good enough? No. no? Any thoughts? Can we just get a mic down here? Any thoughts? Why not? It's not just specific. It's not specific. In, in what way? It's, uh, it doesn't give the details of, of what actually happened in the evenings, so it should have been that he said, you know, you, you, you're accused of saying that you fixed his mum or shaked his mum. Perfect. Um, so... That letter, because it's not clear on the allegation, because the real allegation against Marcus is provoking the fight by saying, I shagged your mum, because I shagged your mum is what the company has been told. It doesn't set out the allegation properly, uh, and this is going to be the first, because here's a heads up, both are going to be dismissed. It's the first in a series of factors that's going to lead to Marcus's dismissal being held to be unfair. Now, uh, Marcus receives this letter. He's suspended which gives him plenty of free time to do what he likes, getting in touch with Ian's mum, maybe. <laughs> and <laughs> they go for their disciplinary hearings with Imran. So I'm going to run through the right way to conduct a disciplinary hearing. Any questions so far? Does it make any difference at all that this was a fight that took place outside of the workplace and not in the workplace? Yeah, good question. Um, it... it can make a difference because uh, in order to justify dismissal you've got to show it's reasonable to dismiss that the um, offence justified dismissal and something that takes place away from the workplace is less connected to the workplace uh, and therefore is less likely to justify dismissal. The classic example of when something away from the workplace would justify dismissal is the manager who puts the hand, the, his hand up the skirt of someone at the Christmas party. But the further removed it is from the workplace, the less likely it is to justify dismissal, um, except for the fact that if you've got two people working closely together and one punches the other, and the other one says, I can't continue working with that person anymore, then the business just has to make a choice. It just doesn't have an option but to make a choice, do we dismiss or do we lose the other person? At this stage, the employer hasn't done the investigation yet, so all they know is that there was a fight between the two parties. So in that context, was the term, was the phrase involved in a fight not appropriate since the investigation hadn't been done yet? Well, I, I think, are you from a public sector employer? No. Who do you work for? I Actually, don't say it because it's being recorded. Are you, are you happy to say it? Yes, no? Yeah, yeah, no, fine. I have my own business, small business. OK. Um, it used to be the case, um, certainly back when I was training in the 80s and 90s, and even more so in the 1970s, that 
standards of industrial practice required a separate investigation meeting and then a separate disciplinary meeting. And many public authorities still have that. But most private sector employers and, and tribunals are very happy with this, now generally merge the two. So there'll just be one meeting with an employer, sorry, with an employee, where the allegations are discussed uh, and the investigator takes a decision, do I dismiss, do I not dismiss, are they guilty, are they not guilty? Um, for that reason, um, you generally put the allegation in the letter when you're calling someone for what will be the only meeting. And if you decide following the meeting that you've got the allegation wrong, you can, of course, always rephrase it. But the employer knows, even at this point, that the allegation against Marcus is uh, saying to Ian, I shagged your mum. May be true, may not be true, but that's the allegation. So they're right to put it in the letter to, to uh, Marcus and indeed are obliged to do so. Does that answer the question? Great. So 11 points. Yeah, we've got another question here. Can we be slightly faster with the mics, if possible? Hi, sorry, um, just moving back a little bit, when you said that, um, in answer to this question, the first question, that there was, it, w it was sensible to bring the disciplinary because Marcus says, if you don't do this, I'm, I'm off. If you hadn't brought the disciplinary, would that have been a constructive dismissal, breach of trust and confidence for Marcus? Probably. I'm not going to say 100% because the employer would be able to say, well, it took place away from the workplace, it wasn't a workplace function, it wasn't really anything to do with us, we can't control the personal lives of the employers, uh, employees. And how would I put, that wouldn't be a hopeless argument. It wouldn't be the strongest argument in the world, but it wouldn't be a hopeless argument. So probably it would be a constructive dismissal. Good question. I'm going to run through the right way to conduct a disciplinary hearing. And there are 11 points I want to run through. Number one, some of these are repeating what I've said already. If I do repeat, I'll be a little faster with them. Number one, allow the employee a reasonable amount of time to prepare their case. Three days is usually enough. If it's a complex allegation of financial fraud, it's going to need to be a lot longer. But something as simple as a punch up in a pub, three days is plenty. Employers and employees, says the ACAS code, should make every effort to attend the meeting. This is number two. But if the employee asks for an adjournment, asks for a delay, unless their reason is completely and utterly specious and ridiculous, grant it once. But you don't need to grant it for more than a couple of days. If they ask for another adjournment, you're quite entitled to refuse, unless it's a very good reason, in which case you should give a second and final adjournment of another few days. The two exceptions to that, two exceptions to that, uh, if the reason for the request for a delay is so the employee can get a workplace colleague or union rep to come along and accompany them, because by law they're entitled to a five-day delay there, or if the employee is suffering from mental health problems backed up by medical evidence and needs longer to prepare. But both of those are relatively uncommon. So number three, prepare for the meeting. Imran has to prepare for the meeting. Have everything ready in advance. Know what you're going to be putting to Ian and to Marcus. For a bit more fun, if you want to have the meeting feeling like an episode of Jeremy Kyle, have Ian's mum waiting in the cupboard ready to jump out when Marcus comes in the room. Number four, it's a good idea to take a note taker in with you. We can all take our own notes, but it's really difficult to keep accurate or complete notes if at the time we're writing the notes, we're trying to think of the, never, the, the next clever question to ask. So it's a good idea, if, if your company's got the resources, to have a separate note-taker in there. Or record the meeting. Chances are the employee will be, so there's nothing wrong with you recording the meeting. A lot of HR people don't like it. Can anyone guess why HR people don't like you recording meetings? They yep, they think you're going to screw up. Um, but there's nothing wrong with you recording meetings. Just don't screw up. And number four, number five rather, I think number five is missing on your handout. At the meeting, explain the disciplinary allegations to the employee and go through the evidence that's been gathered. Allow the employee to set out their case and answer each allegation that's been made. Now bear in mind, many unfair dismissal claims are lost because the manager doing the hearing hasn't actually put every single point to the employee being investigated. So if there's a piece of evidence, say, and what's your comment on that? What's your comment on this? Because otherwise, the employer's going to turn around at a tribunal and say, 
he never gave me the chance to explain that away. And I had a good explanation. Here it is. Just ask them about every point and make sure it's noted. Which is point number six. Take careful note of their response and ask follow-up questions. Nothing wrong with being a little bit forceful when asking follow-up questions. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's almost a mini cross-examination by you of them. And a tribunal will not criticise you if you probe their responses, if you probe their defence. To the contrary, if you don't probe their explanations, then a tribunal is much more likely to criticise you for not following a reasonable procedure. Number seven, don't argue with them. You said you shagged his mum. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Doesn't get you anywhere. Number eight, never, ever, ever, ever give a decision there and then. Often the employer will start to walk out the room and turn and say, I'm losing my job, aren't I? Don't be tempted to reply to that. I haven't decided yet. I'll tell you next week. Even though the chances are you'll, you'll be 99.9% .9 of the way to your decision, probably within 10 minutes of the meeting starting. But never, ever give an answer. Don't use phrases like, you're going down, or <laughs> you can't handle the truth. Give, give a um, very anodyne response. I'm going to make a decision, and I'll send it to you in the next week or so. Number nine, make sure you've given the employee a reasonable opportunity to ask their questions, to present their evidence, and to call their witnesses. Because again, this is another common cause of dismissals being unfair. My manager didn't give me the chance, or didn't tell me it was my turn to bring Fred into the room. Fred could have proved I wasn't there and didn't have my hand in the till. So always, towards the end of a meeting, is there anything else you'd like to say? Is there anything else you'd like to say? Is there anything else you'd like to show me? Very important questions to ask. Witnesses don't have, number 10, the right to... Sorry, employees don't have the right to cross-examine the witnesses against them. Ian doesn't have the right to cross-examine Marcus. Marcus doesn't have the right to cross-examine Ian. It's not an episode of Suits. And uh, if Ian says, I want you to ask Marcus this, as part of your follow-up, you should ask Marcus ask Marcus the question, but there's no obligation to have them in a room confronting each other head to head if you don't want to. It can be tremendous fun if you do want to, but there's no obligation to do it. And finally, number 11, if an employee is persistently unable or unwilling to attend a meeting, hold the meeting by other methods. It's a bit artificial, but it's better than not doing it at all. Do it by phone or Skype or at a neutral venue, or let them bring in um, written submissions. You know, they can put their responses in writing to you. Because a tribunal would rather see that you've considered their response in an incomplete way than you haven't considered their response at all. Now, there's one other point, uh, which would be number 12, if the slides went up to number 12. Does anyone know the perfect last question to ask at a disciplinary hearing? Has this been a fair hearing? Has this been a fair hearing? Six words. Write that down, circle it. I'll tell you why that's such a powerful question to ask. First of all, 95% of employees will answer yes, because they're going to want to... They're people pleasers at that point. You're making a decision on their job. They're not going to want to get on the wrong side of you by suggesting that you've done something wrong. 95% of people will say yes, and if they turn around to the tribunal six months later and say it was an unfair hearing, the tribunal will be much more sceptical and inclined to dismiss their arguments if they said at the time it was fair. And if they do say at the time it's, a, it's an unfair hearing, that's fine as well, because you ask them why. And if they give you a coherent answer, because you haven't asked any questions to my witness, great because you now know what could go wrong, and you deal with it. You ask the questions to their witness, and you've closed down that loophole that they could attack you on. And if they come out with some rambling, incoherent nonsense, say, thank you very much, that's really interesting, I'll think about it, and then carry on with the process. Now, there's a complicating factor here. Um, Marcus, the IT guy, who said, I fixed your mum, <coughs> 
wants to bring a lawyer to accompany him to the meeting. Who'd let him bring a lawyer? We all know what the answer to that one is, don't we? No. Many employees ask to bring their lawyer. Usually they don't have one. It's just a tactic that they think will make the employer say, oh, I mustn't sack them because they've got a lawyer. But the answer can almost, almost always be no. The exception to that, the exception to that is if they work in a law firm, a solicitor's office, because you've got a right to bring a workplace colleague, and if the workplace colleague is a lawyer, you've got a right to bring them. Or if it's a career-ending allegation in the financial services sector, in the teaching sector, in the medical sector, in the legal sector. If being found guilty would mean you are disbarred, struck off, whatever the word is, deauthorised, then you have a right to have a lawyer. But leaving those situations aside, there's no right to have a lawyer. And you should never, ever, ever let a lawyer in the room. I once did a, a case, a, a disciplinary hearing. I was instructed, this is many years ago, and some of you would have heard me tell this story before, probably 15 years ago now, I was asked by a partner in a firm of solicitors in North London to represent her in a disciplinary hearing, because she was the probate partner in a small firm of solicitors. Probates distribute the um, assets of the recently deceased and distribute the assets to, to the relatives. And she'd been accused of nicking money. Now, the evidence against her was pretty overwhelming, it was a slam dunk case. What she wanted from me was to represent her in the hearing, in the internal disciplinary hearing, make a nuisance of myself and try to get the firm of solicitors, rather than going through the aggravation of a gross misconduct dismissal and I would be threatening it every three minutes a tribunal claim, to agree just to terminate by mutual consent. She was never staying at the job. She'd been caught with her hands in the till. But to agree to terminate by mutual consent so she could go off join another firm of solicitors and steal from some more dead people. That was her ambition. And uh, so I turned up to this meeting. The, the senior partner very stupidly let me in, knowing I was a lawyer. Uh, first thing I did, it was, it was before the days of iPhones, I put a dictaphone down on the table and said, I'm recording this. Not can I record, just I'm recording it, because I was trying to get his back up. My aim was to wind him up and cause difficulty. He started reading from a pre-prepared script. I can't remember what it said. It was something like, we're here today to discuss the following disciplinary allegations. And I said, can I have that? And he was really taken aback and he said, no. Why not? Because it's my script, it's personal. Well, wouldn't you agree it's disclosable in a tribunal case? Yes. Are you planning to change it between now and a tribunal case? No, so why won't you give me a copy now? And I went on in that vein for the whole meet. She still got sacked. Um, <laughs> but the point is, lawyers are there to be absolute gits in any disciplinary or performance management hearing. Don't ever let one in. Employees are entitled to be represented by a workplace colleague or a trade union rep. I'm a big believer in, in fact, letting pretty much anyone in the room to accompany them, their mum, their dad, their spouse, their second cousin twice removed, as long as they're not a lawyer. Um, because very often, if someone they trust is in the room with them and listens to the evidence and listens to the allegations, they'll come out of the room and say, my goodness, Bob, you're bound to rights on that. There's no point you bringing a claim. You were really stupid there. Which is a much better position to be in than Bob going home, saying I've been sacked for no good reason, because they spin the version and all the relatives saying, oh, we'll help you bring a claim. You should definitely bring a claim against the employer. So I'm a big believer in letting pretty much anyone in. But they have a legal right to be represented by a workplace colleague or a trade union rep. In theory, the companion can talk, sum up the case, and confer, phone a friend. The companion isn't allowed to answer questions. So if, I, if Imran says to Ian, did you punch Marcus in the face, Ian's companion isn't allowed to answer it. Ian has to answer. Easier said than done, because in reality, the representative butts in all the time. Um, difficult to enforce, but that's the theory. So coming back to Marcus Nian, any questions so far? Yep, just give two seconds for a mic. A bit slightly closer, please. So it's backtracking about the investigation, that being someone independent and the person is holding the hearing. Yep, really good question. So should the person doing the investigation be someone independent of someone doing the, the disciplinary, I assume you mean? Yeah. Um, no, no. In 1970, yes. 
uh, and the ACAS guide back in the 70s and the 80s said you should have separate people doing the investigation and the disciplinary. Nowadays that is absolutely not required. It's hardly seen apart from big organisations that recognise a union where the collective agreement was agreed 30 or 40 years ago in which case it's set out in paper, they have to have the separate stages. But in the modern workplace, no, just not needed. Any other questions? So I'm um, coming back to Marcus and Ian. Ian's response on the disciplinary is, I'm really sorry, I know I shouldn't have punched Marcus, but he provoked me. He said I shagged your mum, I shagged my mum. Um, I don't want to work with him anymore, he's a bit of an idiot, I think you should sack him. Marcus's account, was he was having a quiet drink in the pub with his two IT mates. When Ian came over, started shouting at him, and the next thing he knew, Ian punched him in the face. Now, Marcus doesn't deny saying, I shagged your mum. Of course, what he said was, I fixed your mum, but the company thinks he said, or might have said, I shagged your mum. He doesn't deny saying, I shagged your mum, because the company hasn't actually asked him about it. It wasn't in the disciplinary letter, so he doesn't know that's the allegation he's facing. And Imran is a hapless manager who doesn't really know how to do things, sorry Imran, and says he's just sitting there quietly writing down whatever Marcus says, rather than probing, testing and asking questions and putting the case against Marcus to Marcus. Did you say I shagged your mum? So Marcus goes out that meeting having never denied saying it because he never knew it was an allegation against him. So it's decision time. Just one other piece of information, Marcus says during the meeting to Imran that he's got, he had two friends in the pub, two IT colleagues, who will back up that Ian came over and threw the first punch. So you're the manager, what would you do? How many people, show of hands, how many people would sack Ian, first of all? Nobody at all? You'd all let Ian keep his job? Yep, what about Marcus, who would sack Marcus? You're all either really nervous or really benevolent, and I'm not sure which one it is. Um, what happened in this case was Imran sacked them both. The correct thing for him to have done, the correct thing for him to have done would be to conduct a further investigation before making a decision. Marcus has said there were two witnesses there. So Imran, Marcus's manager, or Ian's manager rather, should have gone over to those witnesses and said to them, what happened? Did you hear Marcus say, did Marcus say, I shagged your mum? Now those two witnesses, had they been approached, could do a number of things. They could refuse to cooperate. They could say, yes, I heard Marcus provoke Ian. They could lie and say, we didn't hear anything. Marcus didn't provoke Ian. Ian hit Marcus unprovoked. And Imran can choose to believe them or indeed to disbelieve them. Any of those are fine from a legal point of view. The one thing that's not fine, the one thing that's not fine is the manager not going and speaking to the witnesses, not doing the further investigation. Because that's one of the boxes, you remember I said this, it's all very procedural. It's one of the boxes that has to be ticked for a fair dismissal, the follow on procedure afterwards. And failing to conduct a further investigation is the most common cause of an unfair dismissal. Nobody would dismiss Ian, nobody would dismiss Marcus. Imran, as I said much earlier, dismisses them both. This is a real case, remember. Imran decided he didn't really know who was telling the truth. He didn't really think he could blame one over the other. He didn't really think they could work together again. He didn't want to just sack Marcus and not Ian because he didn't want Marcus to bring a claim saying I've been treated unfairly, so he sacked them both. Now, is that a reasonable decision? I ask this rhetorically, because I think given you all said you wouldn't sack either of them, you're all going to think it's an unreasonable decision. Um, what I'm going to do is go through the process that you need to go through when taking the decision on whether to dismiss someone or not. And there are six factors. But before you get to the question of whether the offence justifies dismissal, you've got to decide the most basic question of all, which is guilty or not guilty, in connection with both Marcus and Ian. If you decide they're guilty, you then go on to decide, is it serious enough to dismiss? If you decide they're not guilty, it's all academic anyway. Now, 
A lot of people don't realise how incredibly low the standard is that tribunals expect of employers when it comes to findings of guilt. Because in a criminal court, guilt's got to be proved beyond reasonable doubt. Don't know what percentage that is, maybe 70%, maybe 80%. It's beyond reasonable doubt. In civil courts, guilt has to be proven or liability has to be proven on balance of probabilities. That means 51% or more. In an employment case, all the manager needs to do is show he or she had reasonable grounds for belief in guilt. Now, reasonable grounds for belief in guilt is a lot lower than balance of probabilities and even, even lower than beyond reasonable doubt. It's a very low hurdle, which is why I say it's so easy if you tick the procedural boxes to make a dismissal a fair dismissal because the threshold for the correctness of your decision is so low, reasonable grounds. So assume, Imran, you have reasonable grounds for thinking that Ian punched Marcus, and of course you do because he's admitted it, and you have reasonable grounds for thinking that Marcus provoked Ian, well you have because Ian said it, that was his evidence. You might not have followed a fair procedure to get there, but you've got reasonable grounds. So, do you dismiss or do you not dismiss? Six factors. Number one, look at the company's disciplinary rules. They're the starting point. They're rarely the finishing point. Disciplinary rules will typically say something like, um, we, uh, the following offences are included as examples of gross misconduct, theft, fraud, breach, serious breach of health and safety, the whole gamut uh, of possible offences. But it always says include. So just because something's not in that list doesn't mean it's not gross misconduct. And I can pretty much guarantee you that there is not a disciplinary policy in the world that lists as an allegation of gross misconduct saying that you've shagged a work colleague's mum. So starting point, not ending point, is the disciplinary process. It's always useful to discuss with HR, but HR will tell you it's your decision, not theirs. Be consistent. If the company has consistently not dismissed for punching someone in the face down the pub. First of all, you might want to change the culture in your company, but also uh, it would be unfair to dismiss Ian for doing it because the company has in the past allowed such conduct to go unpunished. Maybe a warning would do. Number four, think about mitigation. Are they going to do it again? Have they got a clean disciplinary record or is there a final written warning uh, on the file already? Number five, and this is really important. Would a lesser sanction do? Dismissal has to be a reasonable sanction. If dismissal is unreasonable because no reasonable employer would dismiss for stealing a stamp, then a tribunal is going to be critical and find the dismissal is unfair. So rationalise when you're going through the process why a written warning won't do. And write your reason down. Keep a written note of why a lesser sanction won't work, number six. Because if you can't think of a reason at the time and write it down, you're going to be really hard pressed to justify it nine months later in an employment tribunal. It's a question on the consistency, be consistent with previous. What if um, a decision made on another matter earlier, another employee, had had far too lenient um, an outcome and you, as a, as maybe as a, an enterprise, have moved away from that, that approach, can you now, do you need to rewrite a policy? Is there some way of drawing a line in the sand and having better outcomes? Brilliant question. Um, you're full of good questions today. Um, if you don't want to be inconsistent with a previous disciplinary sanction, but the disciplinary sanction was far too lenient, what should you do? Should you rewrite your policies? Should you just impose the more severe penalty of dismissal, etc.? Um, I hate policies. I absolutely hate policies, first of all. Let's get that out there. Which is why you all have a little thing on your desk uh, about these, these policies I've written here. And in here is a disciplinary policy, um, which says, amongst other things, um, we can depart from previous decisions if we think they're too lenient. Because you can. All a tribunal will want to know is there's a good, credible reason for treating people differently. 
The good credible reason could be there was mitigation in that case, but there isn't in this one. The good credible reason could be uh, that person didn't have any warnings on their record, but this person does. Or a good credible reason could be that sanction was stupidly lenient. So unless there'd been a massive, massive level of consistency with that previous lenient sanction, if that previous lenient sanction had been imposed 20 or 30 times in the past, or I'm, a bit, I'm a bit exaggerating, three or four times in the past, unless that was the case, you'll be fine to impose a more severe penalty. If it had been uh, imposed at a more lenient level consistently in the past, then you would struggle to justify a dismissal and you should not so much change your policy, but just issue a memo to staff saying, if people say they've shagged a colleague's mum again, going forward, that will result in dismissal, or may result in dismissal. So, Imran's made the decision to dismiss. Next step is to tell Ian and Marcus of the decision. And seven points on this. Once the decision's been made, if they haven't been suspended, you can tell them face to face. That's the best way to do it. If they start to misbehave, good practice and established practice is to call security by muttering strangely into your cufflinks <laughs> and calling for help. If they've been suspended, which is 90% of the time, 95% of the time, you'd write to them to tell them your decision. Enclose copies of the notes of the hearing. Contrary to popular belief, you don't have to have them typed up. You'll type them up if you end up in a tribunal, because the judge will need to read them. You might choose to type them up if the employee appeals, because the appeal officer might want to read them, but at this stage you don't need to go to the hassle of having them typed up. Send them manuscript notes. Number three, confirm their right of appeal. Tell them their right of appeal, including who to write to and within what time period. If it's not a dismissal but is a warning, Tell them how long the warning will last, how long it will stay on their file, the change in behaviour required, and how their conduct is expected to improve. Also warn them of the consequences of offending again. If you do this again, it is likely you'll be dismissed. Number five. Obvious point. Obvious point. Only dismiss if you've got authority to do so. In bigger companies, the procedures might say only dismiss after you've discussed it with HR. Number six, as soon as possible, tell the employee, although in a bigger company HR will do this, tell the employee of the date their contract ends, if there's any notice pay, which there won't be in a gross misconduct case, how much their notice is, and I've already mentioned of their right of appeal. And I've already given some examples of, uh, of gross misconduct. So that's what's in the dismissal letter. Any, any questions on that before I move on? Alan, two seconds to get a mic. If there are any other questions, can you just pop your hand up so we can get a mic to you faster? Going back to a couple of things you've said, one of them is uh, the further investigation. One of the things we often come across is people stopping, uh, stopping that investigation when they found a few witnesses that support the company's allegations rather than necessarily all of the witnesses that might give a more balanced viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, you, you said go to HR, they'll tell you it's your decision. My experience is often HR won't tell you it's their decision. I know there's a case where HR has been found wanting for um, swaying a disciplinary decision, just whether that's worthy of just a mention, really. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, all right, any other questions? Appeals. So every employee who's dismissed has a right of appeal, assuming they've got more than two years' employment. If they haven't got two years' employment, none of this matters anyway because they can't sue. So uh, you have to offer them the right of the appeal in the decision letter. I've mentioned that already. Check your policy. Make sure you tell them the amount of time they have to appeal, who they should appeal to. The person hearing the appeal shouldn't be the same person who made the disciplinary decision. It should be someone more senior. Now in, an, in a very small company, there won't be anyone more senior, which is fine. Tribunals understand that. In that case, you simply get uh, someone of a similar level to take the decision. Or if it's a really small company, a one-man band with a couple of employees, the owner takes the decision again 
I know it sounds ridiculous and artificial, but tribunals will say that is better than the alternative, which is the employee having no second chance at all. Another option there, if the company can afford it, is either to ask a uh, trusted third party to do the appeal, or even farm it out to an independent HR consultant who'll do it for, I don't know, 500, 1,000, maybe a little more pounds. Um, I know Alan does this. Alan, what, what, what sort of rate do you charge for a bog standard appeal? 500 quid. So, offer the right of appeal. Number three, um, employees should be invited to the appeal hearing, which has to be held without unreasonable delay. This is where delays often creep in, because the appeal officer isn't really interested in doing it half the time. They've been told to do it, they don't want to. This is where delays often creep in. Uh, more than a few weeks delay, and you could be facing trouble in a tribunal. Stating the obvious, once the appeal's been decided, tell the employee the result, and tell them there's no further right of appeal. Now, in this case, you'll remember both Ian and Marcus were dismissed. Ian doesn't appeal. What he does is he goes and tells ACAS that he's going to bring a claim. Because some of you will know, some of you won't, that before you're allowed to bring an employment tribunal claim, you have to tell ACAS first. Marcus gets his dismissal letter. And for the very first time, Marcus sees the allegation against him. Because in the dismissal letter, it says, I believe you provoked Ian by saying I shagged your mum. Which comes as a complete surprise to Ian, uh, to Marcus, because this has never been put to him. And of course, Marcus, being in IT, is extremely literal and knows that he didn't say, I shagged your mum. He said, I fixed your mum. And Marcus, being very literal, sees that as a very different thing. So Marcus decides to appeal, and he sends in a, le a letter explaining the position, simply saying, I deny I ever said, I shagged your mum, which is true. HR get the appeal letter, they ask a more senior manager to hear the appeal. Imran, can you pick a more senior manager? What's your name? Edward. Edward. So Edward is the appeal officer. Um, Edward hears the appeal. Now, Edward and Imran are actually mates, despite the fact Imran didn't know Edward's name. And um, Edward goes over to Imran and says, mate, what's this all about? I've got to deal with this appeal. Um, tell me all about it. And Imran says, right, we had these two guys. Ian punched Marcus. Marcus said he wanted to shag Ian's mum, or had been shagging Ian's mum. They're pain, a bit of a pain in the arse, these people. I wasn't really sure who was telling the truth. I just decided the easiest thing was to get rid of them both. Do me a favour, listen very carefully, and then don't uphold their appeal, because it would be really embarrassing to me if either of them comes back to work, and it will make me look really bad. So Edward goes off and decides he's going to hear the appeal in that vein. Now, if a tribunal ever discovered that conversation had taken place, it would be a slam dunk unfair dismissal, because they take appeals really seriously. Appeals have to involve proper scrutiny by the appeal officer of the original decision maker's decision. And so many cases have been lost because an appeal was a rubber stamp job. You might think to yourself, how would the tribunal ever know that Ian, sorry, that Imran and Edward had this conversation? And the answer is they do sometimes find out. Lots of the time they don't, but sometimes there might be an email between them, between the time of the dismissal and the appeal saying, uh, thanks for the chat about Marcus. And that email gets disclosed. Sometimes something can be said and slip out in evidence. And Imran might be absolutely confident that he is a highly intelligent man and can run rings around any tenacious cross-examining barrister that might want to question him about the conversation. But the problem is Imran can't be as confident about Edward's ability to run rings around the barrister. Sorry, Edward. And I'm sure you could. And... Um, Sometimes these things just do come out, so don't have those conversations. We're at the appeal hearing for Marcus. He now knows the real reason for his dismissal, which is provoking Ian and saying, I shagged your mum. Um, Marcus says to Edward, I never said that, I never said that, which is true. And he says, I've got two witnesses who'll confirm it. I never said, I shagged your mum. Does it matter if Marcus doesn't bring those two witnesses to the appeal hearing? Yes or no? Yes? No? No. Correct. 
it would be better if he did, but if he doesn't, the appeal officer, Edward, should conduct a further investigation. Edward should go and talk to the two people. And again, it doesn't matter what they say, as ridiculous as it sounds. If they refuse to cooperate, they refuse to cooperate. If they say, Marcus didn't say, I shagged your mum, but he said, I fixed your mum, and it was the same thing, fine. If they say, Marcus didn't say, I shagged your mum, and he didn't say anything that could have provoked Ian, if Edward has good grounds for disbelieving them, fine. The one thing where Edward will land into trouble in a tribunal is if he doesn't do that further step of the further investigation. But Edward, knowing the business wants to be rid of Marcus, just listens very carefully to Marcus in the meeting, and then after the meeting, rings HR and says, I'm rejecting the appeal. So HR write the letter and the dismissal still stands. Managers think, job done. Um, Imran, Edward, delighted. Marcus's replacement is really great. He's really responsive. Uh, he's a personable IT expert who looks people in the eye rather than at their feet when he talks to them, uh, speaks languages other than Klingon. He's everything that the company is looking for. Two weeks later, the company gets a phone call from ACAS saying, we've just been contacted by Ian. Ian's going to bring a claim. Do you want to make a settlement offer? And the company thinks, nah. You know what? As the law stands, you're not allowed to punch employees, fellow employees in the face. We're entitled to dismiss Ian. We're not going to make an offer. After Brexit, maybe different. <laughs> but two days later, they get another phone call from ACAS, this time about Marcus, who's also planning to bring a claim. And indeed, they duly do. And at this point, the financial director gets involved. The FD gets involved. He says, to Imran and to Edward, guys, what's going on here? Why have you got two claims against us uh, arising out of what you've been doing? Because Ian and Marcus have both gone to no win, no fee lawyers. Remember, this is all true. Um, the lawyers are scrutinising the company's processes. It's deeply embarrassing for Imran and Edward, who now feel they're being accused of doing something wrong. And of course they are. Six months pass, three days in the tribunal. Uh, the managers are cross-examined by a 26-year-old barrister who's been doing the job for two or three years and she's very good and very keen and she makes them both look incompetent and hapless. Despite that, Ian loses his claim because the tribunal took the view, rightly, that uh, the employer had reasonable grounds for its belief in guilt. He'd admitted it. The employer had conducted a reasonable investigation into Ian's case and dismissal is a reasonable sanction if one employee punches another, even if it's in a pub. Unsurprisingly, Marcus won his claim. The tribunal decided the employer had reasonable grounds for its belief in Marcus's guilt, because Ian had said, Marcus said, I shagged your mum, and it's reasonable to believe that. But the tribunal found the employer hadn't conducted a reasonable investigation for three reasons. First of all, the original unclear allegations. The original unclear allegations not saying in the letter and not putting in the meeting to Marcus, you're accused of starting the fight, provoking the fight, by saying I shagged your mum. Second of all, by not following up with Marcus's witnesses. That was another reason the dismissal was unfair. Third of all, by simply having a rubber stamp appeal process and not having an appeal by Edward, which properly scrutinised Imran's decision. So the tribunal awarded Marcus a year's salary as compensation, which was about 35k. Business didn't really care about that. The case was reported on page four of Travel Weekly, the industry uh, magazine, including Imran and Edward's names, and including the comment the judge had made in it, his judgment, saying that Imran and Edward simply paid lip service to standards of ordinary decency and fairness. Imran and Edward were sent on training exactly like this training you're all in today. But worse is the Ministry of Justice Courts and Tribunal Service now uploads, and has done since November 2016, uploads every single tribunal decision onto the internet. So when Edward Googles his name, he finds, quite high up on page one, a link to the tribunal decision where the judge has said, 
that Edward merely paid lip service to ordinary standards of decency and fairness. And worse than that, it's also there for any prospective employer of Edward to discover whenever Edward applies for a new job. So getting this wrong can have ramifications. Anyone have any questions? Hi. So um, just thinking theoretically, if the second manager had done her investigation properly and reversed the decision of the line, original line manager, does Marcus then have grounds to bring a grievance against the line manager or where does it stop for them not doing their investigation properly? Yeah. Um, uh, well, you can't stop Marcus bringing a grievance against the line manager for not doing an investigation properly, but HR could and would quite rightly say, um, sorry, yeah, this was all part of a disciplinary process. You were vindicated. You won. Well done. But you can't bring a process about it. You can't bring a grievance about it now. And that would not be nearly enough for... The refusal to hold the grievance would not be nearly enough for Marcus to have a constructive dismissal claim. Because otherwise these things will just go on forever. Back to the investigation. Um, was it fair that the direct line manager can, um, held the meeting? Or should it have been somebody totally independent, so not an employee's direct line manager, um, whereas the other employee could have said, like, you know, that they're really close friends. So had it not gone to dismissal, um, had the manager just issued a warning, let's say, um, then c could that employee have argued that it's the direct manager that held that meeting? Yeah, good question. Um, it's very common, and indeed it's probably more common than not, for it to be the line manager, the direct line manager who holds the meetings. Um, in large organisations, particularly those where the disciplinary policies are relics from the 1970s, uh, they'll usually say someone outside the chain of command should hold the meeting. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Both approaches are reasonable. Neither approach will be criticised by a tribunal. Okay. There's a question there. If anyone else has got a question, just put your hand up so we can get a mic to you so, so we're ready. If we took the case you had, but instead of the company being, you know, wanting to get rid of both of them because they were problems, the company actually wanted to keep them working, what approach could the company have taken um, to the situation? Well, then we get into all the softer HR skills of mediation, uh, having a draw a line in the sand agreement, which I, I always think are completely pointless and never work because the moment somebody looks at somebody the wrong way two months later, it'll all kick off again. Um, but um, if the company didn't dismiss, there is nothing that Marcus could do by way of a grievance or a constructive dismissal claim because it would be reasonable not to dismiss in these circumstances. Just as it's reasonable to dismiss, certainly Ian, it would equally be reasonable to take the view out of work, uh, provoked, so give him a warning, but don't dismiss him. So both are... Have I answered your question there? Yeah, okay, good, good. All right, so let's move on to case study number two. Um, this involves a receptionist at a local high street firm of accountants. Like case study number one, it is a true story of a case I was involved with and is a very typical run-of-the-mill dismissal scenario. Meet Jane. Jane is the receptionist at this small firm of accountants. She's 55 years old, although I think she spent a lot of her 20s in the sun. <laughs> and she started with this firm of accountants when it opened its doors 25 years ago. She's been there with them the whole time. The older partners have known her forever. They're forgiving of her ways. The younger partners in the accountancy firm, for there are four partners, uh, have been getting a bit irritated recently with some of the things she's doing and forever done. Some of the things she's been doing recently have been irritating the younger partners. So, for example, she um, isn't very good at picking up the phone when clients ring. She's very good at being very chatty and friendly with the clients when they get through to her, and she chats and chats on the phone for so long that new people phoning in don't actually get their calls answered. So she annoys the clients, and because of that, she annoys the partners. So number one is she doesn't pick up the phone very often. Number two is she doesn't track door fobs. So she, um, this, this firm of accountants, like so many of us, have little door fobs. This is my chamber's door fob. Have little door fobs in order to get through doors. And Jane, the receptionist, is in charge of handing them out to workmen who come for the day. Uh, she's in charge of giving temporary ones to people who work in the business. 
if they've misplaced theirs or left them at home. And she's meant to collect them in, keep track of them, collect them in, and make sure they don't get lost. She's rubbish at that. She never tracks them, never collects them in, so they go missing. Which means the company has to pay a little bit of money to replace them every so often. Not that big a deal, but of more concern, it's a security risk. Problem number three is that she doesn't keep the, the single meeting room tidy. So she will uh, f allow a new client meeting to go into the conference room when the old client meeting hasn't been cleared away properly. Now, none of these are sackable offences, not even close to it. But they are irritants, and the junior partners want them sorted out. They're also not very happy at the fact that her coffee is absolutely horrible, but they're not sure what they can do about that, and it doesn't form any part of the performance management we're going to talk about. So it's all discussed at a partners' meeting. The two younger partners are unconvinced she's the right person for the role going forward. She might have been great in the past, less convinced about the future. They think if you get little bits of uh, coffee stuck in your mouth, then that's grounds for dismissal. Boom, boom. Um, <laughs> Thank you. My wife tells me I should never t try telling jokes. Anyway, the two older partners value her loyalty. They think, uh, yeah, it's just Jane. She's been here forever. She's incredibly loyal. Doesn't really matter if sometimes the conference room is a mess. Doesn't really matter if the fobs go missing. Yeah, we'd rather she picked up all the calls, but ultimately the clients will call back. So the four partners reach a compromise, as people who own businesses do, and they decide to shunt the whole problem over to the office manager. Alana. And Alana is a very sensible woman uh, who thinks the first thing she should do is just deal with it informally. Because the brief she's been given is, get it sorted, but if you can't get it sorted, get a new receptionist. That's the compromise. So the first step with any performance management conversation is to have an informal discussion. Now, if you can deal with performance issues early, then not only does it stop them escalating, but you can prevent the bad feeling that comes from formal, yeah, formal performance management processes. If you talk to the employee, you might find out there are reasons for the underperformance, particularly if they've been working for you for a long time. If they've been good employees for a long time and suddenly their performance shoots downhill, well, we know they can do the job, so there might be a reason. It might be any reason such as family problems, problems with colleagues, they might perceive that they're being bullied. And talking to them informally about this can knock a dismissal process or a performance management process on the head. If training can help, offer training. It's less time consuming than performance management, it's less confrontational, and it's far less expensive than going through performance management, dismissing, recruiting, and retraining. Now, if the informal chat doesn't help, the fact an informal chat has been had, and keep notes of it, remember general tip number one, keep notes of all conversations, the fact an informal discussion has been held will help if, six months down the line, you end up dismissing on grounds of poor performance. Because the ACAS code encourages an informal discussion. Tribunals like to see that you've tried to deal with it informally before dealing with it formally. And bear in mind, of course, discussions over performance should be held in private and should be conducted sensitively. They're not like disciplinary allegations where it's actually good to be firm and test the employee's account thoroughly, you've got to conduct performance conversations sensitively. Remember again, to get to this stage, they've been working for you for two years, because if they hadn't, none of this applies anyway. So it's important to be careful and sensitive. If you're doing an informal process, can you argue with your employee if you don't agree with what they're telling you? Uh, the mic didn't pick up the beginning, so i just repeat the question. If you're doing things informally, can you argue with your employee if you don't agree with what they're telling you? Absolutely yes. Um, I mean, one always... My talking loudly is another person shouting. So saying arguing with the employee could equally be just explaining clearly what the problem is uh, or why you don't accept their explanation at face value. So um, absolutely nothing wrong and indeed absolutely right to be blunt with the employee. It's never a good idea to 
use uh, you know, you know, 1950s um, language in order to avoid being blunt. So in a harassment case, if someone is accused of maybe harassing somebody else, I know that's not performance, you don't want to start in a meeting accusing them of all sorts of frightfulness because that won't make the allegation clear. Uh, the clearer you are in all these situations, the better. And that doesn't have to be arguing, but blunt talk is a good thing. The other thing you need to think about is what's the actual reason? Is it can't or won't? Is it they can't do the job, because that's underperformance, or is it that they won't do the job because that's misconduct. And you treat misconduct differently from performance management. Now, very often in the real world, it's actually a combination of the two. Because someone realises they're, they're dropping behind a bit with performance, and they get frustrated, and their confidence goes down, and as a result, their effort goes down, and it ends up spiralling down. So it's often a combination of the two. And if it is a combination of the two, treat it as performance management rather than misconduct. But if you think they won't do the job, treat it as a disciplinary issue, if they're lazy or indifferent. So back to Jane. Alana goes and holds an informal meeting with Jane. Alana sits down with Jane and says, look, we think you're fabulous. You're so good, we love having you here. But, and as you know, whenever anyone says but, you can completely ignore everything that's gone before it. But, just a couple of things we'd like to raise with you. And she explained the problems. Number one, you chat to clients on the phone for too long, as a result of which you're engaged when other clients try to phone. Number two, the temporary fobs aren't being collected back. Number three, you're not getting into the conference room straight after meetings and tidying it up. She says, Alana says an afterthought, almost as a throwaway comment, a couple of people have said we don't really like your coffee and maybe you can go and buy another brand. So Jane's sitting there through the meeting. She sits there through the whole conversation and is thinking to herself, I've been making coffee for 25 years. I've been tidying the conference room for 25 years. Who's this person who's telling me how to run things? And meanwhile, she's nodding and smiling, making the right noises, and Alana's thinking this conversation's going really well. So Alana finishes up by thanking Jane for her time, pouring her coffee into the yucca plant, <laughs> and going back into her office. Alana makes a file note of the conversation, sends an email to Jane recording the points of the discussion, because she's doing everything correctly. The email makes it clear it's just intended as an informal conversation, not a formal warning. Jane goes home. And that night, Jane is sitting in front of the television, watching Crossroads. And a thought occurs to her. Maybe they don't have a problem with how I pick up the phone. Maybe they don't have a problem with me tidying the rooms, or the room, insufficiently speedily. Maybe, just maybe, they want someone in this job who's younger, and prettier than me. And once that thought's in her head, it won't go away. But she's had a bit of a shock, and for a few weeks, things improve. She's listened to what was said. Conference rooms are tidier for a few weeks. She spends less time gabbing on the phone with the old clients. Um, yucca plant needs replacing. <laughs> but after those few weeks, things begin to deteriorate. Because I'm sure you've all experienced the problem. You put someone on performance management, performance improves. They come off, it goes down again. Yo-yo. Everyone experienced that? Yep. So, what happens next? Alana decides another meeting is called for, this time a formal meeting. And she contacts the phone company to establish exactly how many calls have been dropped over the last three months, or not answered. Because she's establishing the baseline for setting a target, which is exactly what she should be doing. She sends a letter to Alana in advance, Sorry, sent a letter to Jane, inviting Jane to a meeting to discuss performance concerns. She sets out the three areas in the letter. Dropping phone calls, losing fobs, not tidying the conference room. And she tells Jane the time and the place of the meeting. We've been through this with case study one, Ian and Marcus. And she says that she's intending to set formal performance management targets. So far, perfect. Jane gets the letter. She's becoming more and more convinced the company's trying to engineer her out and replace her with someone who's younger and prettier. So she puts in a grievance. Now, this is a really common problem. You bring someone in for a disciplinary charge 
or a performance management charge, and they put in a counter grievance against you. Everyone had that? Many people had that? Yep, lots of nods all around the room. Yeah. So, what do you do when someone lodges a grievance during a performance management process? First and foremost, if you're a line manager, consult HR, because HR really need to be involved with this. It's not something you can handle yourself. There are three possibilities, three types of grievance, and you handle them all differently. Grievance type number one is where the grievance is about the fact that Jane has been put under performance management. I'm putting in a grievance because I think I'm bloody brilliant me, and I don't think you should have put me under performance management. That's easy to deal with, because all that HR will do if they're doing what they should do, is write back and say, OK, but this isn't really a grievance, it's just your response to the performance management allegation. It's you saying you shouldn't be performance managing me because you're bloody brilliant. Uh, and they'll say, we're not treating this as a grievance, just tell all that to Alana, explain to her why Alana has misunderstood your performance levels, your competency levels, and deal with it as part of the performance management. Nice and easy to deal with. What gets fun is if the employee lodges a grievance against HR's decision not to treat her grievance as a grievance. Because then the best thing for HR to do is to lodge a counter grievance with themselves against Jane's decision to lodge a grievance against HR for not treating her grievance as a grievance, at which point everyone's head explodes. So number one is easy to deal with. Number two, if the grievance is about something entirely different, Again, easy to deal with. <coughs> Jane's been brought up on performance management. She puts in a grievance about the fact that four weeks earlier, she'd asked to go down to a three-day week and it had been refused. It's got nothing to do with the performance management. So again, in that situation, HR will write back and say, OK, we've got your grievance, thanks. We'll deal with it. This manager over here will deal with that grievance. Meanwhile, Alana is going to continue with the performance management. And it will not derail or should not derail the performance management process in any way. Grievance type number three is a little trickier. That's where the grievance is attacking the motive of the manager or indeed of the company. You're only trying to performance manage me out because you don't like people with ginger hair. You're only trying to performance manage me out because I slept with your wife. You're trying to performance manage me out because, you know, in this case, because you think I'm too old to do the job and you want to replace me with someone younger and prettier. Now, how do you handle that situation? If it's an allegation against the individual, so in other words, Jane says Alana is the one who's got the dodgy motivation, there's an easy way and a hard way to handle it. The hard way to handle it is say, oh, we better set up a grievance into whether Alana is motivated by age and put your performance management on hold while we investigate Alana. The easy way to deal with it is to say, OK, then we'll appoint someone else to do the performance management. And it might be galling, but that's the way. You need to be in a company of a sufficient size to do that, but that's the way to deal with it. And if the employee turns around and says, actually, that person's biased against me as well, say, OK, here are two more names, pick one. And if they don't or won't or say that all those people are racist, sexist, ageist, the tribunal is going to think they're a nutter anyway and no tribunal is going to criticise the business for allocating one of the people to carry on. Slightly more complicated if um, the individual is saying there is a corporate disinclination to give for a fair hearing. There is a corporate, or in this case an accountant's, um, predisposition to get rid of the old and bring in the young and pretty. Because in that case, unless the grievance is obviously not credible, so if the grievance was, God spoke to me last night and told me you were out to get me, that would be not credible. I apologise if anyone is highly religious and that offends them, but a tribunal would not criticise an employer for regarding that as not credible and just saying, OK, let's carry on with the performance management anyway. But unless it falls into that category, that's the situation when you do have to put the grievance on hold and set up a sep sorry, the performance management on hold and set up a separate grievance into the allegations raised by the employee. It's a pain, 
it's delaying, but you will get into trouble with a tribunal if you don't. Again, if the employers work for less than two years, none of this matters because they don't have the right not to be unfairly dismissed. Now, rather than categorising Jane as Category 3, because she's raised a grievance about trying to get rid of me because I'm old, I'm going to take the simple approach for the rest of this talk and assume that her grievance was just Category 1. Uh, she put a grievance saying, I think it's wrong to performance manage me, and HR simply say, fine, let's carry on, and if you're brilliant at your job, you'll be able to prove it. So, HR right to... Um, Jane, say, we're not taking your grievance seriously. You've got to engage with this process properly. Basically, wake up and smell the disgusting coffee. <laughs> and they set up a meeting with Alana. This one is a formal meeting. Now, if you are setting up a formal performance management meeting, there are eight things I want you to think about, or do. Number one, and I've already mentioned this, send a letter setting out the areas of concern, inviting the employee to a meeting, unless, of course, the concern is they never turn up to meetings, <laughs> in which case there's no point inviting them to attend a meeting to discuss the fact they never turn up to meetings. That raises a whole other area of issues. Number two, meetings should take pr place privately. Again, the, some of these are points I've already mentioned. The right tone and emphasis is important. It should be supportive, not uh, accusatory, accusatory, but you need to be firm. Number three, try and establish the reasons for the underperformance. Number four, work out if there's anything you can do to help the employee improve. This comes back to the training point. I strongly recommend the London Business School's course on not being crap. It worked for me. Number five, set measurable targets. If you like the acronym, SMART targets. Make sure they're reasonable. Ideally, try and get the employee's agreement that they're reasonable. Now, most employees, if you ask them to say, do you agree it's reasonable to expect you to sell 25 widgets in the next month, will say yes. That, that presupposes it is a reasonable target. Because most employees, at the beginning of the performance management process, will think they can do it if it's a reasonable target. At the end of the process, they'll turn around and say, that wasn't a reasonable target if they don't achieve it. So it's really useful, if you've set up in advance them agreeing it was reasonable, to close down that argument and line of attack by them before they can use it. Number, what are we on? Six, set a reasonable time period for improvement. Depend on the role, it might be as little as a month, more commonly it will be three months. Some roles it might be longer, but three months is a good rule of thumb. Agree how progress will be monitored, number seven. And number eight, explain the potential consequences if improvement isn't reached. If you don't reach these targets, we may have to have a formal meeting, a further meeting where you may have a final warning or even be dismissed. So there are the eight points for the letter and the meeting. Back to Jane. Jane goes into the meeting, this is the formal meeting with Alana, it's now her second meeting, because she's had the informal one and the formal one. She goes into the letter, in, into the meeting, um, and she's given a formal letter afterwards setting out three targets. Target number one, no more than 10% dropped calls. Target number two, no missing fobs. Target number three, clean the conference room within 20 minutes of a meeting leaving, and sooner if there's another meeting about to go straight in. These are not onerous targets, you wouldn't have thought. And Jane agrees they're reasonable. And things improve for three months, the three months for which she's being monitored. But yet again, she doesn't sustain the improvement. And over the next three months, things start to slide again. So the manager calls her in. Alana calls her in for a third meeting. She's had the informal meeting. She's had the formal meeting. And this is now the third meeting. And this is the final opportunity to improve. Jane's given a clear letter setting out, uh, we ha continue to have performance management concerns, and we're going to monitor you over a six-month period. Why six months? Simple reason. Because where the problem is a yo-yo employee, someone who has shown they can 
sustain improvement for a short period of time, there's no point giving them the same period of time again, or worse, a smaller period of time for their final chance. You've got to give them a longer period of time. If they improve, great. If they don't, then you go on to dismissal. Now, with some uh, jobs, sales, for example, the first set of targets uh, might be a three-month target. You've got to achieve sales figures in three months. And if they don't achieve that, it's perfectly reasonable to say, right, we're giving you a final chance just one month more. But with a situation like this, particularly where someone's been working for 25 years and they can show they're able to sustain a short period of improvement, you've got to give them longer second time round. So, Jane is told in writing, uh, being monitored over a further six month period and if she fails to meet the targets of fewer than 10% drop calls, no fobs missing, conference room, conference room tidied within 20 minutes, the firm will have to consider dismissing her. How do you prove a fair performance-related dismissal? Five points. Number one, this is very fundamental law here. To prove you've dismissed somebody fairly for performance, an employer has to show the employer has been told about the required standards, given warnings about underperformance, given time to improve, and warned about the possibility of dismissal. ACAS, this is point two, recommends at least two warnings are given before you dismiss somebody for poor performance. Again, this presupposes they've been working for more than two years. If someone's rubbish in their first six months, you don't have to go through this process. You don't always have to give two warnings. I'll come to an example of when you don't have to give any warning at all in a moment, but that's the base standard that you should meet unless there's a reason for giving fewer warnings. Number three, Diarise the review period. For goodness sake, diarise the review period. People miss this out all the time. So Jane might have been trundling along under her review period, but because Alana forgot to diarise it, the six months goes by, then another month, then another month, and Alana only gets on to dealing with things after 10 months have elapsed. And if that happens, there is a real chance, not inevitable, but a real chance a tribunal will say, well, if it wasn't important enough to dismiss her after six months, why is it important enough to dismiss her after 10 months? Point number four, if you get an employee who yo-yos, as Jane does, goes up and down and up and down, they improve, they relapse, they improve, they relapse, may be treated as a misconduct issue. If performance management is getting you nowhere because they keep meeting the targets and then relapsing, you know they can do it. Remember the difference between can do, or can't do and won't do? You know they can do it. Maybe they're just choosing not to do it when they're not under performance review. Treat it as a conduct issue and go down the disciplinary route. And point number five, exceptionally, you don't need to give warnings at all. If you have an employee with a good track record who makes a really, really serious mistake, so it could be a banker who loses 75 billion pounds, or, or a really serious mistake, usually involving health and safety, then a tribunal will say it's fair to dismiss without warnings. Now, the classic example of this is a case called Alidair, as in air, airline, Alidair against Taylor. Uh, Captain Taylor flew for Alidair. He, on one journey, came down to the ground with a very hard landing. He had the misfortune that the CEO of Alidair, his employer, was in the plane at the time, as was Mrs. CEO, and he got sacked. He brought a claim saying, look at the ACAS guide. The ACAS guide says I should be given at least two warnings. They've sacked me without any warnings. That's unfair. And the tribunal laughed at him. The tribunal said, look, mate, there are some things that are so serious that we can't allow you to develop a track record in getting this wrong. We can't 
expect an employer to give you a second opportunity to crash a plane after you've nearly crashed it the first time. So Captain, Allade Captain um, Taylor lost his claim. Going back to the dismissal, you give them um, two chances or, or have to give them the extra chance. Do they have to be related for performance? Can you explain a little more? Um, so if Jane isn't keeping the, uh, picking up the calls and she isn't clearing away the boardroom, if she has an issue with another part of her performance that hasn't been documented before, is that related in the two chances to dismiss? So what you're saying is she sorts out the fobs and the phones, but then she stops emptying the bins, something yeah. different. Yeah. Um, it would be difficult to justify dismissing her first time round for that, even if she's on a final warning. But I don't think a tribunal would expect that if she's already on the final stage of a performance improvement plan, you've got to reset the clock to zero. So you could just give her one warning on that and then dismiss. Jane's still going through her performance management process and she doesn't meet the targets. So the records from the phone company show that she has dropped an average of 12% of calls over the six month period. She hasn't met her 10% target. She's failed to keep track of three fobs. She's managed to keep the conference room tidy, but her coffee still tastes horrible. <laughs> and as a result, the manager calls a final meeting. The letter sets out the way in which she's failed to meet the required standards. It warns her she's likely to be dismissed if there aren't any mitigating circumstances. There aren't, and she's dismissed. As a result, she appeals to the senior partner. The senior partner isn't happy about upholding the decision. Jane's been with his firm for 25 years, but he recognises she's not up to scratch. He recognises she was given every opportunity to improve. He recognises the business has followed a fair procedure. So he turns down the appeal. Jane goes off to a lawyer. The lawyer looks at the documents looks at all the letters that have been written by Alana and tells Jane she doesn't have a claim. <clears throat> the business has done what it needs to do. It's given her opportunities to improve. It's kept her fully informed of its concerns all the way along. It's given her the chance to put forward mitigating circumstances and it's reached a reasonable business decision. So that's uh, the second case study. Meanwhile, Jane's replaced. Her replacement drops 90% of all of the calls. Her replacement hands fobs away to strangers. Her replacement doesn't even know where the conference room is, but she looks like this. <laughs> so the partners are absolutely delighted, especially when it turns out the new receptionist is Ian's mum. <laughs> so any questions on this so far? Uh, if it's been less than the two years, are there any circumstances in which you have to give any particular special notice or any performance programmes? No, uh, you don't have to go through any procedure if, the, um, if they've been employed for less than two years, except in two or three. Two situations. Three situations. Situation number one is where the contract actually gives them rights over and above the minimum that we've been talking about. So the contract actually says after six months, we won't dismiss you unless you blah, blah, blah. Situation number two is if your business recognises a union and there's a collective agreement saying you will go through these procedures. So whilst it won't be unfair to dismiss Jane in those circumstances and she wouldn't win a claim, you run the risk of a row with the union and possible industrial action. So that's a commercial decision rather than a legal one. Situation number three is if the employee suffers from a disability and can't do the job for a reason related to her disability, then even if he or she hasn't got two years employment, you still have to show that you've tried to make reasonable adjustments and that you can establish a really good business reason for dismissing someone who's disabled. Alan, two seconds for the mic. If, sorry, if, if anyone else has a question, can you grab a mic, put your hand up so we don't have to wait for the mics to get to you? Alan. Hi, Daniel. If, if Jane said that I was being performance managed because I'm 
I want, you want somebody younger. Would age discrimination not prompt uh, an idea that you'd, you know, you'd need to follow a process to show that it yep. wasn't that? You, and, and that comes back, let me go all the way back to this slide quite some time ago. Here it is. This comes back to that being uh, type of grievance number three, where you... Oh, we'll get that. Type of grievance number three, where you'd have to put the performance management on hold and go through the meeting. But then you'll remember I went on to say, let's pretend it's not type three, let's pretend it's type one. Uh, any other questions? Nope. Yep. Just two seconds, sorry. Just one second, sorry, just for a mic. Yep, great. O otherwise the video won't pick you up, that's why. Uh, could Jane actually return after she's left and point out the fact that the new receptionist is not performing and is younger and prettier? That is a brilliant question. With the caveat that you have to notify ACAS you want to bring a claim within three months, so if it was later than that, she would struggle to bring a claim. She might get an extension of time, but it would be a struggle. With that caveat, absolutely. And if she could prove that she was replaced with someone young and pretty who was rubbish at the job, she would have a very, very strong claim for age discrimination and showing that the reason for the dismissal and the performance was actually a sham designed to get her out for an age-related reason. Any other questions? We can either, we're about 10 minutes before finishing time, um, we can either, you can either throw questions at me on any employment or topic you want, we can have a mini Ask Daniel Anything question uh, session, or we can finish 10 minutes early. Quick show of hands, well, that's a question. Yeah. Will other employees be notified that, um, let's say Jane, is on, um, what's it called? On um, performance management. management. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, and in fact, it would be, as a rule, it would be quite wrong for any other employees to be made aware that you're going through a performance management process with any particular employee. There may be circumstances where somebody has to know. Can we just get a mic over here? There may be circumstances where somebody has to know about it. Perhaps the person doing the decision isn't the individual's line manager, and so the line manager would be told someone's on a performance improvement plan, but generally it should be kept quiet. And if it, it's spread by the company and someone gossips about it, someone from HR gossips about it, and it gets around the company, that person would have a decent claim for unfair dismissal. Any compensation they got would be reduced because of contributory fault, because their poor performance led to the situation, but they'd still probably technically win a constructive dismissal claim. Imran. Do they have rights of representation to any of these meetings? Uh, yes. They, f from a legal point of view, a meeting that might result in a disciplinary sanction, which includes a warning, which includes a warning about performance, is a meeting to which the right to be accompanied by a trade union rep or workplace colleague applies. So yes, they have a right to be accompanied, not at the informal meeting, but all the other ones. So the one about the fight, I mean, suppose the uh, facts were different. I, I understand why you say that both should be subject to disciplinary procedures, but suppose uh, the guy had just said, I slept with your mum or I shagged your mum, and the response hadn't been a punch, but had just been shouting or abuse or something. Now, in that situation, would you still say that the person who said, I slept with your mum, should be the subject of a disciplinary procedure? Well, I certainly... Th well, Because it's the same well, behaviour, it just had a different yeah, result. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, but I think it was wrong to dismiss Marcus in the first example, and I think it would be just as wrong to dismiss Marcus in your example, where it doesn't result in a punch. Saying to someone, I shagged your mum, is stupid behaviour, nothing more than that, that I think justifies... Uh, an informal telling off, or at worst, a first warning. Right. Certainly doesn't justify dismissal. And if the guy didn't throw a punch, he just shouted back, that wouldn't justify anything. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, we've got two at the back there. 
Um, you talked about uh, staff yo-yoing before on performance management. If you've got a member of staff yo-yoing on sickness absence, so short term, a million different reasons, they're perhaps on their third warning, mm -hmm. they behave, then they go off again. Um, how would you handle that situation? Pretty much the same way. Uh, we're not saying it's deliberate, but saying, look, we've got to take a view on, on someone being at work. You're here, you're not here, you're here, you're not here. Your Bradford factor score, slightly old-fashioned way of doing it, is, is too high. Um, and uh, you know, unless your performance improves, unless your attendance improves, you're out of here. So over the next three months, we expect you to be here. We expect you to hit a 92% or 96% attendance rate. And if you don't, goodbye. And as long as it's been made really clear to them what the consequences will be, and as long as they're not disabled, because if they're disabled, you've got to make reasonable adjustments to the attendance trigger, then you'll be absolutely fine. There was a recent case in the Court of Appeal where the court was very, very clear no employer should be expected to put up with employees who go off sick, then come back, then go off sick, then come back, and just about meet the attendance targets each time. And chat next, you had a question? Um, sorry, just to go back to the last of question. Um, Can you put the mic slightly closer The Marcus closer to and the um, Ian situation. If they were on a different level, so you've got, I don't know, may maybe one of them is the senior manager and the other one's just mm -hmm. a regular employee, mm -hmm. do does that change it because of the dynamic in the behaviour? So you'd expect the, I don't know, the, the senior manager to behave in a, in, a, in a better way, perhaps? Yes and no. I I'll give you the yes bit first. Uh, the yes bit is you would always expect a senior manager to behave more responsibly than someone who reports to them, or more accurately to exercise more restraint in the, in the face of provocation. No, in that these things are often decided by gut instinct. Do I think this person should be sacked? And everything that comes afterwards is rationalization of the gut instinct decision to dismiss. So you could choose when you're rationalizing your gut instinct decision to dismiss, whether or not you want to take into account the fact that someone is more senior as being an aggravating factor, or whether the fact that someone is more senior is irrelevant because they shouldn't be doing it anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions over there? Uh, any more, just so we can get the mic to you? Sorry. Just really quickly, when you mentioned about performance management and um, performance issues, finding a reason why, um, if you've got an employee who's been through this process yo-yoing, about to start again, and then the line manager's just said, but I think he's now homeless, how do you deal with that as an employer? Sensitively? Yeah. Um, sort of how long do you, do you take that into account for, on the basis that he's been yo-yoing in, in bad performance? And what can you do to help, really? Yeah. Um, the... Well, the legal answer to your question, because there's a legal and a practical answer to it, the legal answer to your question is you just have to act reasonably. And a tribunal would be unhappy that you didn't allow longer in a monitoring period for someone who's just been made homeless. I'm not sure it would be enough to tip a fair dismissal into an unfair dismissal. It might be, it might not be. These things are so sensitive to the facts and the way people give evidence, you can't really give a definitive answer. Um, on a practical level, how do you help someone who's become homeless find a home? I don't have a magic wand answer to that. Um, y y the obvious steps, you maybe phone the local authority and get on the phone to the local authority and support them. Maybe you, um, you know, help them look through adverts, but it, it's just common sense. Looking at that particular case, would any of those points that led to her leaving or, or being moved on not raise during her normal appraisal process and couldn't that have been brought into into question yeah really good question wouldn't these points have been raised during an appraisal process first of all you're assuming that all because i know you come from a big organization you're sm assuming small organizations do performance appraisals lots don't but parking that lots of managers when they do appraisals are really really crap at it because they're working with people on a day-to-day -day basis they're nervous about confrontation and they'll often give people artificially high scores on performance appraisals partly because it reflects well on them partly because they want to avoid confrontation so uh, it's often a big bugbear for HR that they'll be told by someone 
uh, we want to dismiss Robert because Robert's really rubbish. Um, and they asked to see the performance appraisals and the manager who's just asked to dismiss Robert in every one of the last three performance appraisals has given Robert five out of five and put a little gold star on. Um, performance appraisals don't normally tell the whole story, but the, you're absolutely right that it would be good practice to raise it during a performance appraisals and a business's failure to raise it during performance appraisals will be an argument in favour of the dismissal being unfair but not a very strong argument if the business has gone through all the processes that this one did gone through the informal warning the formal warning and the final opportunity if it had been raised during performance appraisals in three consecutive quarters then the business could quite justifiably say, look, we've raised this with you three times, you're now on a final warning and go straight to that stage. So performance appraisals help the business go faster, but I don't think you can really criticise a business for not raising issues on performance appraisals if it goes slowly before the dismissal. Does that answer the question? Any other questions? Yep. One, one second. Um, thanks. So um, just taking that a step further, so if... Um the business hadn't followed the correct process or hadn't done things correctly, and then the appraisals are all glowing and don't really mention anything about performance, I presume then that in a tribunal it's, that's not going to reflect particularly well on the business. Where would it stand if the performance appraisals had mentioned it but the business hadn't followed the process? How, how does that work out? So, so you mean the, the performance appraisals had been critical of FOBs and clearing the rooms I guess it, yeah I, I guess it's if they um, if the manager ha hasn't has done the right thing in the um, appraisals but they haven't followed the process what what's the tribunal's view on that have they been given fair warning or well again it depends on how slowly or how quickly the business goes when it comes to the termination process if the business simply says um, look you've been told about this three times um, we're now giving you a final chance I don't think a tribunal would have a problem with that if the employee's been told about it three times. If the business says you've been told about it three times in the appraisal and even though we've never warned you it might lead to dismissal and even though we've never given you a good kicking and told you you've really got to pull your socks up but we're going to sack you now, the tribunal would take a pretty dim view of that. It, it, it's all a sliding scale. Do you mind speaking into the mic? Time frame, can you so take closer, closer? Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Over what time frame can you take things into account? So you've done the performance measure, you've got to six months review, they've passed, twelve months down the line, you're back to square one again. Yeah. Can well, you that bring that into account? Uh yes, but it's difficult to do it that way. Um, because tribunals don't like it enormously. Uh, logically, it is reasonable to take into account the fact that employers peaked and troughed and peaked and troughed, but tribunals are resistant to it. They think once something's been dead for 12 months, you should bank it, uh, because ACAS says warnings generally shouldn't last for more than 12 months. And in that situation, there are really two possibilities. You don't want to go through a performance process again, because you know 12 months later you'll be in the same place. So you're left with two options. Option number one is treated as a conduct issue. They won't do it rather than they can't do it. We know they can do it because they do it when they're being kicked up the backside. So we have to assume it's because they won't do it and treat it as disciplinary. Option number two, and this is the most sensible option to take a lot of the time, is offer them some money and get them out of the business that way. Right, I think we've got time for one more if there is another question. Yes, no, no, great, good, fabulous, we're done.